multifaceted. There isn't really one verse that simply encapsulates everything. So what I'm going to do is just give one or read one warning uh, that's given to us by the Apostle Paul that we would not be taken advantage of by Satan. And it's in the context, we believe, of the uh, church discipline that was enacted by the church of Corinth against the man who had committed incest with his father's wife or his stepmother, who was apparently put out of the church, but then who repented and was brought back into the church, but perhaps not accepted as he should have been. And because of that, um, uh, Paul is warning them that uh, Satan might be taking advantage of them uh, by causing this to come about, to distress this brother uh, beyond what he's actually able to bear. And, you know, here's, well, here's another lesson for us, I, uh, and that is that uh, there is forgiveness, there is mercy, even when there's sin, and when there is repentance, we do need to receive and accept that brother or sister that has repented and not ostracize them. Uh, that's one of Satan's tactics, to get us not to accept one another, to cause division. Well, let me just go ahead and read the text. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote to you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, I have forgiven if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes, in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, those last, um, that last verse really is the basis of a book which I would recommend to you, um, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices by Thomas Brooks, that is meant to show us what Satan's devices or schemes are. Spiritual warfare is, is a huge subject. Satan has many different ways that he can take advantage of us. Uh, Precious Remedies is a book about this thick. It's probably not more than a couple hundred pages. But if you want to read the magnum opus or the, the greatest work on the subject that's ever been written, uh, the, uh, the, book, uh, the book The uh, Christian in Complete Armor by William uh, Gurnall. I think uh, William Gurnall is one of the most insightful writers, at least that I've ever read. It's about 1,100 pages, and it, it's not redundant. It's a book on spiritual warfare. John Newton said if he, could, if he had to be stranded on a desert island and he could only have one book besides the Bible, that's the book that he would take uh, with him. It's in the library. You might uh, check it out. So we are opening a rather large subject. We're not going to go into that kind of detail, of course, uh, in it. But this evening, we do want to be made aware that we are in this warfare, and this is what is keeping us from having our eyes on the goal the way that we should. Now, this morning, <clears throat> remember, we were looking at how important it is that we use the time that the Lord has given us well by keeping our eyes on the goal, keeping it on the prize, keeping it on that day that the Lord has set aside in which we will stand before Him. We need to remember that time is precious. It's precious because we have so little of it to begin with. We really don't know how much that is. But even if we live to be 100 years old, which very few people in the world actually do, it would still be very short. 
it would still fall under what James tells us that our lives are really like, a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. If you've ever watched um, you know, a, a tea kettle steaming on a stove, you know that vapor does not hang around very long. If you've seen you know, the marine layer or the fog in the valley dissipate when the sun comes out, it, it doesn't last very long, and that's the way our lives are. They go very quickly. And of course, once the time is past, once we've spent it, there's really nothing we can do to get any of it back. It's very precious. We need to make sure we use it well. It's precious because it's only during this time that we have here that we can be saved, as we saw this morning, that we can receive the Lord Jesus Christ and escape judgment. Remember, the author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. If we leave the world without Jesus, we will have no hope. We'll only have the certainty of judgment. So as we saw this morning, we need to make sure we're trusting him now. We also need to make sure we do what we can to help others trust in him. And we also saw that we need to make sure that our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is more than a mere belief in the facts. We need to make sure, as we saw in Matthew 25, the sheep and goat judgment, that we see within ourselves that evidence of having savingly believed, the evidence of loving service to Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said? Inasmuch as you have done these things to the least of these brothers of mine, you have done it to me. Every believer, every one of the sheep, uh, showed that love to the Lord Jesus Christ by ministering to his people that needs to mark our lives as well. And then finally, we saw that time is precious because it provides us with the only opportunities that we have, that we'll ever have, to gain the rewards that the Lord has promised us. It's only what we do for Him and give to Him in this world that we'll be able to keep forever, which is why our Lord Jesus Christ tells us not to store up our treasures on earth, because if we do, we will eventually lose them. They'll either be stolen from us or corrupted or we'll die and have to leave them behind. But if we give all that we have to the Lord, and I think we could spend a lot of time filling out what that means. Obviously, it doesn't mean absolutely everything, but it does in one sense that we uh, put it at his disposal. Whatever we give to him, we will get to keep. We'll be storing up treasures in heaven. And so, while we have time, we need to use that time as best as we can, not only that on that day we'll be numbered with the sheep, but that we might be honored among the sheep. Now, this evening, as I've already told you, I want us to consider why we don't use the time that we have better than we do. We want to consider what it is that gets in our way, what the obstacles are who these enemies are, what these enemies are, that we need to overcome in order to gain the prize or in order to obtain the rewards. Now, as I said this morning, I'll say again this evening, we are familiar with these things. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but we do need to be reminded of these things from time to time because we tend to forget. And one of the reasons why we forget is because our enemies are working to try to get us to forget. So they need to be brought to our mind again. We have enemies working against us, and those enemies are the devil, the world, and the flesh. And I put them in that order because that's the order in which I really want to deal with them. The devil is our primary enemy, and he works through the world, and, of course, to get a hold of our flesh that he might cause us to fall. So tonight, I just want us to take a look at what these enemies are and how they relate to one another because the first step to overcoming our enemies is to know our enemies. Well, the first enemy is, as I've already told you, the devil or Satan. Now, the devil is a fallen angel. The devil is arguably God's greatest creation who fell because of that greatness. Now, it's interesting that in the Bible there appear to be different kinds of angels, uh, perhaps a variety, several varieties, that God has created 
for different purposes. And I think primary among them are what are called cherubim and seraphim. Now, the seraphim, uh, and the name seraphim essentially means fiery ones. And it's believed that they're called fiery ones because of the, the burning affection that they have for the Lord. These are the ones that were created to praise Him. These are the ones who were created to minister to Him, the ones who stand around the throne of God and wait upon Him to do what it is He calls them to do. Isaiah writes about them in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3. If we don't know any other passage in Isaiah, we, we typically know this one, where Isaiah was lifted up into the holy council chambers of God in order to receive his call as a prophet to God's people. One of my Old Testament prophets pointed out that whenever a prophet was called, more often than not, we have a record of his, being, of his entering into the council chambers of God in order to hear what it is that God had to say, in order to see him. This was a part of his call. Well, as Isaiah is lifted up, he sees things that we don't get to see here. But one day we will. This is what we read in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3. He says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, the interesting thing is these seraphim were created to do the very thing that, that we're actually here to do this evening. And one of the reasons why the Lord redeemed us and what one day we will have the privilege of doing before the throne of God in heaven, and that is to worship the Lord. So the seraphim were created to basically exalt God and to speak of his greatness and of his glory. Now the cherubim were created for perhaps another purpose. And as we see what they do in Scripture, that purpose appears to be to guard God's holiness. Now, think about this for a minute. That's actually what Adam and Eve were originally created to do when God put them in the garden. He put them in the garden to cultivate the garden, but also to keep the garden, which doesn't mean to tend it in the sense of cultivating it, but rather to guard it, because the garden is the sanctuary, or at least was the sanctuary of God. They were to guard the garden, but they failed to do this. And after they fell, they were cast out of the garden. And when they were, God put two cherubs at the entrance to the garden so that they would do what Adam and Eve were supposed to do. And that is to guard the sanctuary of God against intruders. But now these cherubs would keep Adam and Eve from intruding into the garden because they could no longer be there because of their sins. The garden was God's sanctuary. The garden was God's temple. We could no longer go into the garden because of our sins. We can no longer enter into heaven. Now we have to draw near to God through a mediator, which God, of course, has mercifully provided to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. So cherubs guard the holiness of God. Think about when the Ark of the Covenant was built how the Lord commanded that these angelic figures were crafted on either end of the ark and that their wings be stretched out above the mercy seat, those angels were called cherubs. Now, Satan was one of these cherubs. He was created to guard the holiness of God. He was created to be the greatest among them, but he was the one who fell away from the Lord. Speaking of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, verses 14 through 17, but it's believed more likely referring to the one who was the influence behind this king of Tyre because the things said of him could not be true of any earthly man, we read about Satan's fall. Uh, this is what he writes. You were the anointed cherub, who covers, again, you were like one of those 
uh, cherubs that were stretching out their wings to cover and protect and guard the holiness of God. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. God made him good. God made him perfect until unrighteousness was found in you. And by the way, we're not going to get into the issue of exactly how that happened. We're just going to talk about the fact that it happened. He goes on to say, By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. When I said we're not going to talk about why it happened, what I mean is how that could happen. This is what happened. He became prideful, and his pride was his undoing. Now, this particular cherub, this particular angel believed that because of how the Lord made him, that he could be equal to God. And it was his pride that was his undoing. Again, we read in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So again, the idea is because he was made to be so great, he fell because of pride. He believed he could be equal with God. Now this fall of Satan must have taken place after the creation week rather than before. You know, there are some who believe that as, as we begin the book of Genesis, it says the earth was formless and void and so forth and darkness was over the surface of the deep. The reason must be that God created the world. He made it nice, but when Satan fell, he came down and destroyed the world and so God had to recreate it. I don't think that that's what the Bible is telling us. I think what it's telling us is before God created, before this work of creation, there was absolutely nothing and in those six days in which God worked, he made everything, including the angels. Uh, one of our Old Testament prophets believes that's what's included when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and that the heavens were created first, and this would be the place where God dwells uh, with the angelic host, because that's not an eternal place. The angels are not eternal. Only God is eternal. Heaven is not eternal. That's a created place in time where the angels would be and where we would go and we die to go to be with him. Uh, and the reason he believed that was because it goes on to say, now the world was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And as he goes on the next to describe the work of the next six days, part of that work is the celestial heavens and the sun, the moon, and the stars. But that's a part of the world that, that he's organizing and creating. So he believed that the heavens that he creates were, were different Plus we have, or the, the place where God dwells. Plus we have the statement in Job where it talks about the sons of God, the angels rejoicing as God is doing the work of creation in the world. So he makes them to be, as it were, the audience that sees this creation. So here in these six days, we, we have the creation of absolutely everything. And at the end of that week, God declares everything that he had made to be not just good, but to be very good. And that includes all the angels, even this particular cherub. But shortly after that week, he fell away from God because we know it wasn't very long uh, after the creation week that he tempted Adam and Eve and brought about this fall. And again, I'll tell you the reason why uh, the Puritans came up with this thing was Edward Fisher. In his book, The Marrow of Modern Divinity, remember the book that we were looking at that Ferguson was talking about? It really has to do with legalism and so forth. But he points out that Eve uh, 
She couldn't have been. Adam and Eve couldn't have been in the garden for very long. Not more than a month, really, because they were perfect, because they were given the blessing or the ability to be fruitful. They were given the command to multiply and to fill the earth. And that's something they would have begun right away, and that's something that there would have been nothing, absolutely nothing to prevent them from conceiving. But Eve did not conceive until after the fall. You know, conception and childbirth, I mean, pain and childbirth is a result of the fall, but not conception and birth. That would have taken place without the fall. But it didn't take place because they weren't in there very long. So Satan fell shortly after the creation week was over because he enters into the garden, tempts Adam and Eve, and they fall away. We also see from Scripture that when Satan fell, that he took some of the angels with him. It's believed perhaps a third of the angels based upon what John writes in Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. These angels, as we know, became the demons, and that is the army that the devil has essentially enlisted, the one that he is in control over. Now, Jonathan Edwards speculated that the occasion of Satan's rebellion and fall was when God announced to the angels that the reason he created them and their work would be primarily to serve the men and the women who would inherit salvation. Remember, that's what the author to the Hebrews tells us is the purpose of the angels. Are they not ministering spirits sent out to render service to those who will inherit salvation? And Satan, being so perfect and so powerful and so wise, could not bring himself to stoop to serve those so far beneath him. Now, that's another pride issue. We've already heard he thought he could be equal with God. And one thinking he could be equal with God, to stoop so low as to serve someone as menial as, as man, was more than he could bear. Now that's interesting because the reason that God made him so great in the first place was that he might serve. That's another point that Jonathan Edwards brings out and we need to think that. Those who are strong ought to, to bear the weaknesses of those who are weak. Those who are called to serve, our Lord Jesus Christ who is the greatest becomes the servant of all. We are given power, we are given whatever authority we might have, we're given whatever gifts we have in order that we might serve. Remember what Jesus says in the, in the, uh, you know, the judgment of the sheep and the goats? He says, inasmuch as you have done this to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me, we were made to serve. And that's what the angels were also made for, to serve. And that's why they are greater than we are, is because they were made to serve us. But now that Satan has fallen, now that he's been cast out of heaven, his nature has changed, obviously. He wants nothing more, nothing less, than to destroy God. He hates God. But he can't destroy God. There's nothing he can do. He's infinitely less than God. So he wants to do the next best thing, and that is he wants to destroy God's image. He wants to destroy us. Now, again, a lot goes into that, but I think Easton's dictionary gives us a good summary of this. I recommend that dictionary. It's a good Bible dictionary to have, but this is what he writes in the conclusion of his entry on Satan. He says this, He is Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. He is the constant enemy of God, of Christ, of the divine kingdom, of the followers of Christ, and of all truth, full of falsehood and all malice, and exciting and seducing to evil in every possible way. His power is very great in the world. He is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Men are said to be taken captive by him. Christians are warned against his devices and called on to resist him. Christ redeems his people from him that had the power of death, that is the devil." Satan has the power of death not as Lord, but simply as executioner. Now again, the purpose of this was simply to introduce us to this enemy, and, and this is the longest introduction because he's the one that we really need to be concerned about, uh, certainly the world as well and the flesh, but we'll look at that in just a moment as to how those things are related. But the devil is real, the devil is powerful, 
The devil is dangerous, and he wants to destroy us. That's why Satan warns us in 1 Peter, excuse me, I said Satan, why Peter warns us against him in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 9. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now think about this for a minute. Here's a warning to his audience to be alert because the devil is prowling about looking for somebody to gobble up. Now, are we watching for him? Because that didn't just apply to them, that applies to us as well. Are we on the lookout for the adversary? Are we on the alert? Well, if we don't believe he exists, we're not going to be. If we forget he exists, we're not going to be. We need to be reminded he's very real. He may not be dealing with us personally, but there are plenty of demons also. And again, he has his snares laid out for us in our second enemy, which is the world. Now, let's, let's look at the world and let's look at the flesh again a little bit more briefly than we looked at this, but to realize that these also are things we need to be on the alert against. Now, when we are told the world is our enemy, we need to understand that it isn't the physical world, it's not the universe that God created to display his power and his wisdom. It is the world system that the devil controls. It's the devil's activity in the world by which he seeks to undermine God's work. Satan is the mastermind behind it all. He is the one who is in control, and he has been since the time it was handed over to him by Adam in the garden. Adam was originally created in Eve. I'm trying to remember where we heard about this recently. I think it was um, R.C. Sproul. He was talking about the fall. Adam and Eve were created to be co-regents, or I think the correct term is vicegerent under God, to be rulers under him of the creation. We had that authority, we had that control, but it was handed over to the enemy. And Jesus doesn't even dispute Satan's claim to be able to give him the kingdoms of the world if he will fall down and worship him, which of course was absolutely impossible that Jesus could do. But Satan is the mastermind. He is the one who is in control. That's why Paul calls him the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. That's why he calls him the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. He's the one who creates this spiritual atmosphere that's all around us in society, the society in which we live. He is the reason why the people of this world hold the values that they hold, which are contrary to God, the things that those who don't know Jesus believe to be important. This is the reason why they believe these things are important and why they're spending their lives trying to seek for all the gusto they can because they only go around once in life. That's Satan's doctrine to try to keep them bound in their sins. He promotes the gospel of wealth, the gospel of fame, the gospel of power. You know, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Because there's a lot of churches, so-called churches, that are proclaiming that gospel rather than the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world is what the devil places in front of men to keep them deceived and to keep them bound in sin. And we see it promoted virtually everywhere, on just about every billboard, in every magazine, sadly, in every school textbook, in just about every commercial that's on television, in every TV show, movie, concert, political rally, it's in the mouths of everyone around us. There is nothing that is really escaping the influence of the world, which is why we need to be on our guard against it at all times. This is what John warns us against in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 16, where he writes this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Health and wealth, gospel preachers need to pay attention to this. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What is the world? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is Satan's tool to destroy men, or so he believes, so he thinks. We do need to remember that Satan, even though he has this control, is not in absolute control. There is one who controls what he has control over. There is one who holds his leash, so to speak, and that is God. God could stop him at any moment. He could take absolute control away from him, but he allows him to continue for his own good reasons, to work out his good purposes, to bring about the redemption of his people, and to prepare us for heaven. God uses all the evil he allows to exist, even Satan. He works it all together for his glory and for our good. But again, the world is a massive tool that Satan uses to try to undermine us, to try to undermine the work of God, but God reverses that and turns it around for our good. And then our final enemy is the flesh. Now, the flesh we're all very familiar with because we all have it. It's what's left over of the spiritual corruption that was in our souls when we were born into this world and we became a part of Adam's line. After the Spirit's work of the new birth, there was still this remnant of sin, this remaining corruption. It's what the theologians have called original sin. Now, original sin is not referring to the first sin that was, that was committed by man. It's not referring to Adam's first sin. That's what brought it about. But that's not what it is. It's referring to the origin or the source of, our, of the sins we commit, the actual sins that we commit. It's the corruption that's in our hearts. It's the source of our difficulties and our problems. Paul calls it the old self that we are to put off. He writes in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. It's the body, you know, it's, this has actually led some people to believe that um, that corruption is actually in our physical bodies rather than in our souls. But I, I believe it is in our souls. But listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 26 and 27. He says, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body. King James says, I buffet my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now, he's not saying there that <laughs> he has to wrestle with his physical body because his physical body wants to do something other than what he wants to do. But he's talking about the battle he's having with his flesh, with his desire to do things other than what the Lord has called him to do. He has to beat it down. He has to buffet it and make it his slave. He has to bring all these things under control so he can yield his members to the Spirit of God and do what the Lord actually calls him to do. This is also what he calls us by the Holy Spirit to kill this flesh. He writes in Romans 8, verses 12 through 13. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So what he's saying is if we yield ourselves to these desires, if that's the pattern of our life, if that's our practice, we'll die. It shows that we have not had that power broken by the Holy Spirit. Because if we did, we would be practicing righteousness and not sin. You see, all the flesh wants to do is sin. So we can't yield to that. We can't live according to the flesh. We must live according to the Spirit. We must be putting to death the deeds of the body. And if we are, it shows we are alive. If we are, we will live. We will live eternally. This remaining sin in our hearts is the same nature as the devil. It shares that in common with him. It's the same thing that he is entirely. It is hatred of God. Now, most importantly for the subject of spiritual warfare, 
that flesh inside of us, that remaining corruption, that sin, is what makes us liable to the attacks of Satan. It is his ally that lives in each one of us. Now think about this. When Satan came to Jesus, he found nothing in him that he could fasten his grip on. There was no sin in him that he could tempt or entice. That's what Jesus meant when he said in John 14, verse 30, to his disciples, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. You see, there was nothing he could fasten onto, nothing he could grab hold of because Christ was sinless. He had no desire for those things. But the same thing cannot be said of us. When Satan comes to us, he finds a, much in us that he can you know, take hold of. There's a great deal of sin that he can tempt, which is why we need to put it to death. Now again, these are our enemies, the devil, the world, and the flesh, and they are working continually against us to undermine our faith, to get us to fall away from the Lord, to weaken our love for God, to basically obscure everything that we need to see and that we need to experience and desire in order to move ahead. So this, these are the obstacles. I, this is really all we have time to look at this evening are what the obstacles are, but we do need to be aware that they are there and we do need to understand what they are and we do need to understand what they're doing against us to try to stop us. Now next week we'll begin looking at how we are to overcome these things and how we can strengthen ourselves against their attacks by growing stronger in faith and stronger in love. That's actually what the Lord intends this assault against us to to produce is greater faith and greater love. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and to apply it as, as he would in, in our lives.